So in the audience, um, uh, Mel has put me in charge of this session. Um, I asked him what I should be doing and he said, ah, I don't know, whatever, basically. So I've decided that everybody in this session should speak with a fake British accent. Okay, I'll do my best. And I'd like to kick off with Bob Vaughan, who um, will speak on generating functions in additive number theory. So where you go, Bob. Well, thank you very much, Trevor, and uh, thank you, Mel, for the invitation to speak. Um, so I'm going to talk about something which is not uh, frightfully new. It's something I did a couple of years ago. Um, but I thought it was, well, at least it's additive number theory. It may not be quite uh, additive combinatorics um, because my training is basically in analysis and I apologize for that. Uh, but, um, and it's a, it is a topic which has interested me on and off for most of my career. And, uh, and it has a lot of relevance to additive questions in number theory. So uh, let me, start by introducing to the exponential sum I want to talk about. This is a rather general um, exponential sum form from a polynomial of degree k. And um, there's a, there's a huge history in connection with sums like this, of course. Um, and the, the, the e, e, by the way, is e to the 2 pi i alpha, uh, if I understood the argument. Um, so the usual. Um, exponential function as viewed by a harmonic analysis. And um, I think probably the first place this ever occurred is in Herman Weyl's famous paper in 1916 on, on equidistribution, where um, you can um, use this sum to prove that uh, a polynomial um, of this kind uh, with at least one irrational coefficient is uniformly distributed modulo one. and Vial's paper also contains a technique for, for dealing with the exponential sum. As, um, and then from that, you, of course, can attack the original problem through something which you now call the Vial criterion. OK, so that um, was an important uh, first step in some ways. And almost at the same time, just slightly later, um, really um, as a consequence of this very famous paper of Hardy and Ramanujan on the partition function, um, when Littlewood came back from his army service in the First World War, Hardy and Littlewood started to look at ways of using that uh, technique, the Hardy Ramanujan technique for other problems. And one of the first things they looked at was Waring's problem. I think actually not the first, I think they actually looked at Goldbart first, but the first they published was actually on Waring's problem. And um, they, of course, used a power series expansion, uh, valid, of course, in the unit disk. They looked at the S the powers of this and then looked at the coefficients and then used the Cauchy integral formula to um, give a formula for the coefficients. And then they did some approximations to the integrals. Anyway, uh, so you might say this is not the same sum, but in principle, um, you can get from one to the other by partial summation in the special case when the, all the coefficients of alpha k are non-zero. And um, so they had a problem, Hardy and Littlewood had a problem with this series in that um, they couldn't cover the whole of the unit circle with the side of arguments they had in mind, um, which are the arguments that came out of the Hardy and Minujian work. And so um, they were, in some sense, rescued by Herman Weyl's paper. Uh, they were able to take his treatment of this sum and modify it through partial summation and so on to say something about the region they couldn't otherwise tackle. And of course, that led to the famous hardy littlewood method. Um, so although it doesn't appear explicitly in the, in the final results of, their, of Hardy and Littlewood's work, it, it nevertheless played an important role. Okay, of course, then Vinogradov said, well, um, well, why are you wasting time with an infinite series when you, it suffices to use the finite series? <laughs> and uh, so he was able to, he worked directly with f of alpha k in place of g of z. Um, and I think it 
first occurred in 28. Uh, certainly, he was using it by the mid, by the early 30s. There is a paper in a very curious paper of Vinogradov in 1928, where he he um, works on Waring's problem, but he doesn't, I think, use the hardy Dupre method. He uses sort of density result. But I believe that the exponential sum plays a role. Okay. Um, there's another important uh, use of this um, exponential sum, which was also introduced by Vinogradov in the 1930s. And this, this of course, is the famous uh, Vinogradov mean value theorem, which in recent years we've been hear hearing a great deal about because of the work of Trevor, of course, and of uh, Bourgain and Guth and Demeter, um, where they, we now have, of course, the best possible version of the Vinogradov mean value theorem. Um, and of course, this is concerned with the number of solutions of this uh, system of diophantan equations with the variables um, in some interval from one to p. And um, you can, of course, write this as an integral involving my favorite exponential sum. Okay. So, uh, the, again, it, it plays an important role, and in fact, um, um, it, uh, the usual way, the first thing you do is to, is to manipulate the sums and so on. Anyway, um, so, uh, um, and of course, information about the mean value can be, ex uh, or from the mean value theorem can be extracted um, to give information about individual terms. Certainly, if you can average over enough things, um, if you can actually, if you take your f of alpha and then do some perturbations on the alpha or, or something to do with the sum, then you can you start averaging over those perturbations and then you can relate to the mean value theorem. And in that way, um, the estimates for the mean value theorem uh, give a bounds for the exponential sum, which are of importance in Waring's problem. And it turned out for the Riemann zeta function about the zeros um, near the one line and the order of magnitude near the one line. And that was first done, I believe, by Chudikov, not by Vinogradov. I think actually Vinogradov didn't immediately uh, recognize that there was a connection with the Riemann Z function. We certainly didn't exploit it. And Chudikov, well, it's hard to know exactly what was going on uh, at this distance. But certainly the first published paper that I'm aware of is due to Chudikov. And the best zero free region we have for the Riemann zeta function is obtained through estimates for, for this integral, of course. Okay. Uh, but the thing I really want to talk about today is the behavior of this function on what I would call the major arcs. Um, so for, by a major arc, I typically mean um, the set of alpha or the set of intervals which make up um, the points which satisfy inequalities of the kind I've displayed here. That is, you take a rational approximation aj over q to alpha j of the form q inverse qj to the minus one, um, and you suppose, uh, as you can, that um, um, the, this GCD is equal to one, and you suppose and you restrict your attention to fairly small values of Q. And typically by a major arc, you th you're thinking of a situation where R is significantly smaller than the product Q1 up to QK. In fact, very much smaller than typically. Um, I mean, you'd like, of course, to be able to deal with uh, the whole range, but that seems to be well beyond what we can hope to do. Anyway, um, by the way, I'm going to suppose that K equals three k is greater or equal three through most of this talk. The case k equals two is, well, k equals one is kind of trivial. Everybody, I think, knows how to sum a geometric regression. And at least, it's not clear that my students do, but that's another matter. Uh, and um, the case k equals two, on the whole, it's better treated by methods which uh, come out or parallel uh, modular relations uh, or continued fraction algorithms. Um, the best results we have are obtained that way. Anyway, um, now 
the complement, if you take the, the k-dimensional torus and you take the complement of m, then in most problems, it's that region which predicates the outcome of, the, of your, your research. And uh, unfortunately, um, that is often a considerable difficulty and, and, and a considerable constraint. However, as it, it's very helpful very often to have the best possible result you can obtain on the major arts, because at, at least that way you can reduce some of the difficulties on the minor arts. And so that for that reason, I've been interested in over many years in trying to push as far as possible our understanding of what's going on in the major arts. Okay, so most of the work over, over the, well, ever since Hardy and Illwood has been to do with the special case when we just have a monomial for our polynomial. However, um, well, we, we shall see. Um, there are other cases which are also of interest. Um, in this case, um, you can you take your approximation uh, a over q to alpha, and you suppose that the difference between alpha and a over q, call it beta, is relatively small. Then you can start to analyze f of alpha by picking out the residue classes modulo q for the ends, and you hope then to be able to approximate um, in that way. And what you find is that you get a main term or putative main term, Q inverse S of Q at A times I of beta, where now you have a complete Gauss sum formed from the K powers, and you have an integral, which would just give you a P if um, that should be an integral, not a sum. Um, the integral from zero to p of, of e of uh, two pi i beta x to the k. So if beta equals zero, you just get a main term of p, which is what you anticipate when you divide into residue classes. And if beta is small but non-zero, then you see that you start to get some decay from that p. That this this integral should start to drop off a bit. Okay. And. If you look at the original papers of Hardy and Littlewood, you can see that what they have is an estimate for the error term of this kind, uh, the rather poor saving for, for the, in the Q aspect, and are not very, uh, sort of the worst you can get out of partial summation for the other aspect. And it, it, it's hard to pin down explicitly, but typically I think this is what, what they have. And in some instances, they just use the crude bound Q instead of this, this result. Um, okay, so, so the first important progress on this, I think, was due to Davenport and Heilbronn in 1936, who uh, got better exponents for the error term. Um, they got two thirds in the case k equals three and three quarters in the case k is greater than three. And they also removed that um, beta factor here, as long as beta is not too large. Um, so they required, I think, Q to be at most P to the one minus epsilon and, and the absolute value of B to be like this. Okay, and so this, these have become traditionally what we think of as the major arts. Um, and it, following the ver work of Andre Bay on, on, um, on um, sums, well, more general sums than this, S of Q and A, where you have a, extra terms in, which is relevant to an Australian world, um, then you can actually reduce this exponent to one half. Okay, and I, I don't know who the first to do that was. I think um, Huard um, probably was the first. Um, and then I noticed in 81 that you can actually reduce the beta part and without any constraints on the beta. Um, so th this is a very clean kind of result. It holds regardless of of uh, the value of beta and holds whenever a and q are co-prime. And it certainly gives non-trivial estimates for a wider range of, um, of beta and q. Um, and is, is rather useful in some applications of Hardy. Um, it also, I think, led to, um, to 
think it was what stimulated to some extent Heath Brown's work on cubic forms in the 80s as well. Okay. Um, one of the things you can do here is you can try and cover the whole interval. So if you um, take Dirichlet's uh, famous theorem on Diophantine approximation, you take um, a general parameter capital Q uh, and you look at the for any given alpha, you can find a rational approximation, alpha minus A over Q, at, at most little Q inverse, capital Q inverse, with the little Q at most capital Q and Q and A co prime. When you insert that, those bounds for Q and beta in the error term here, what you find is that you get um, a, fu a, a function of capital Q. And the optimal value for capital Q turns out to be P to the three halves. And it, you get P to the three quarters, which is, well, that's kind of brilliant because it gives you another proof of uh, Viles inequality and it covers the whole of the uh, uh, unit interval, the whole of the torus. So it means that there's a possibility of using major arcs only in cubic problems. And, uh, um, something which has been exploited a little bit. Okay, so far so good, I think. Okay, uh, so for the rest of this talk, I want to talk about really some work with the Brandes, Parcel, Pouliasse and Shakan, which came out of this famous workshop that Trevor hosted in Bristol in June, 2019. Um, okay. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the workshop was concerned mostly with uh, this conjecture, which I think, um, well, without the P to the epsilon due to Bourgain, is it not? Um, concerning the uh, size of um, binomial um, exponentials, um, where you, here you have a, um, a cubic, well, a cubic polynomial, but there's just a linear term and a cubic term, and you have some arbitrary complex coefficients. And I believe the case P equals eight was what was the target of the workshop and I believe that it's still unresolved. Is that correct, Trevor? Yes, he nods his head. Okay. Sadly, um, it's a very interesting question though. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, anyway, as things got sort of got bogged down, it was suggested that it might be a good idea to look at the corresponding exponential sum where you don't have these arbitrary coefficients. And I suggested, well, looking at the cubic one, uh, I've written down the more general case, uh, the one with the leading term alpha k, m to the k. And um, yes, so there is some history with, uh, with such an expression. Um, let me just, oh, this looks complicated, doesn't it? But let me just say that uh, just as with the monomial case, you expect if you can pull out um, the residue classes modulo Q, you expect to get um, a main term, which looks like this, S sub K of Q, A1, A K, divided by Q times an integral. And I've correctly written it as an integral this time. And you have a complete exponential sum for S sub K here. And um, the integral looks like this, of course. And then you have some error term. So the question is, what can what can one prove? And um, there is a paper of Brudon and Robert. I presume he's French, right? Not not English, right? So, um, so I think Robert would be the well, uh, some approximation to the pronunciation. Anyway, my apologies if I if I screwed that up. Um, so they obtained this bound Q to the one minus one over K plus epsilon times one plus P to the K mod beta to the sub K to the half. You notice that only beta K occurs. It's one of the features of, of having a linear a term here. You know, if you, if you didn't have the, the higher power term, if you just had a linear term, there would only be one peak at the origin. And that, that behavior in some ways is reflected in the behavior even when dealing with more general polynomials that the linear term has very little effect. And you can see that here that you can, as long as you choose a one appropriately, um, you can you 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 can get a bound here which is independent of, of beta one, which is quite interesting. 
okay. So, um, and it was pretty clear from, from their proof that this, uh, there is an obstruction to getting past Q to the one minus one over K here, which um, is a little sad in a way, but um, okay. So, and, and just with this result, because of the weaker exponent, you cannot, even in the case Q, K equals three, cover the whole of the torus um, or the square of the torus. Um, unfortunately. Okay, so what we did uh, in the workshop was to start looking at what was going on in this particular example. And what we discovered was that the, the obstruction uh, was a few terms, which could be annoyingly large. And that for the other terms, um, when you apply the Poisson summation formula and so on, went through the whole circus, the whole routine of, uh, of, of the method which had been developed earlier. Uh, you could, in fact, for, for the rest of the terms, get Q to the half plus epsilon times one plus P to the K times the modulus of beta K to the half. But you had these extra terms, which look pretty weird, right? Um, but they are generally there. And I love this notation, by the way. We have, uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it, but it's the uh, sort of the double bracket of x. Uh, it denotes the nearest integer to x. Uh, by the way, there might be two nearest integers to x, so I think we have a little indefinite article here. Okay, and uh, the dagger indicates that um, you sum over distinct values of this expression, d times this uh, double bracket of a1 over d. And it turns out if there are two nearest integers, both may be included. So it's a, it's a little weird. And of course, the, there is a term sort of corresponding to the expected main term here. Um, I think actually that, that corresponds to D equals Q. Okay. Um, good. So, and various um, things one could say about this. Um, if you take k equals three, then indeed the error term here is still going to be bounded by p to the three quarters plus epsilon on the minor arc. So you do have one of yet another proof of the vial inequality in this more general case. Um, okay. Um, if if you oh yes if you um insist that beta k stays on what you might hope to be a major arc, so you make some assumption like this for the beta k, then you can remove this second factor here and just get q to the half plus epsilon. Um, maybe some situations where that's more useful. Um, but typically, um, it doesn't really matter very much in most applications because then the, the, you've got more constraints on the beta k anyway. Okay. Um, oh yes, I want to include here something that was done a little bit earlier, uh, the, the case k equals two. Here you can see the case k equals two is quite different, that you'd only get the main term. Um, and um, the methods of proof of this are quite different as well. They, they, this is based on a, a method which imitates the behavior of uh, theta functions. With the the, it uses some modularity. Um, okay. Okay, so one of our collaborators mentioned this open problem, uh, uh, which took me back a little bit because, well, for various reasons. Uh, first of all, um, it's a kind of odd problem. It, it, it has some peculiarity about it in my view. But okay, so you take this um, exponential sum, which we've just been examining, and take, okay, take the, this rather peculiar combination of coefficients. So you have alpha plus gamma for the leading coefficient and alpha for the linear coefficient. And you look at the supremum over all alpha on the torus. Okay. And then you choose uh, theta um, just on the boundary so that this is smaller than one. 
space. So, so what's the optimal value of theta? Say, Bob, that you're heading into injury time now. Oh, am I? Oh, sorry. Okay, I should get on. Okay. The answer, well, let me move on then. The answer, uh, first of all, let me explain that the motivation for the question comes from PDEs. And um, if you know that theta three is a half, it follows the fractal dimension of the linear Schrodinger equation would be seven halves. And don't ask me about this. I have nothing, I have no idea what this means, um, but, but uh, it sounds very impressive. And apparently there are similar applications. Okay, so what we were able to do was unfortunately show that these numbers are equal to three quarters. <laughs> and, um, and basically it involves all sorts of interesting things like Kronecker's theorem, sorry, on, um, uh, Kinchin's theorem on diophantine approximation and various other things like that. So uh, basically I think I should stop here. I don't want to go into proofs and uh, they're too complicated, but there was one other, I want to end with a question and maybe Trevor knows the answer to this. Um, so it has some connection with generating functions, this time with generating functions for primes really. Okay, look at this complete exponential sum similar to the one we had before, but now twist it by a character, non-trivial character modulo Q. Okay, what's the best bound you know for this? Is it really true that this is bounded by one minus one over K plus epsilon? I don't know how to prove it in general. I know how to prove it if, K, if, if Q is prime, and I know how to prove it if this is the principal character, but if Q is P squared or P to the T, I do not know how to prove this, okay. I know how to get some exponent less than one here. So uh, I'm gonna finish with this question, see if anybody knows the answer or has a reference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, that's excellent. Um, <clears throat> so um, if anybody has any questions, they can send them through the Q&A or the chat and on past experience, that usually takes a bit of time for people to um, get their typing fingers going. Um, I don't know the answer to this question. It, it, it looks plausible, but then how do you actually do it? So, well, I worked very hard on it for a while, for several days. And I have the exponent I have here is one over k squared plus k. Yeah. Which you can, you can guess where that comes from, right? Yeah. When it occurs to me, um, one might have a chance to look at a mean value of this and use um, Sort of the model type. Ah, um, uh, yes, so that works very nicely for Q equals a prime, of course, but for there you have a anyway. But for higher, I mean, I looked at this. I mean, the problem is when you come to looking at the number of diagonal solutions, uh, if you're not working in a field, uh, you run into uh, problems of divisors of zero. Yeah. So you can, you can get it to, to work when. Um, you know, sort of uh, the AI and Q are co-prime, this kind of thing. That's yeah, and you can, work, you can get it to work if the roots are distinct and stuff like that. Yeah. If, if the XI, which are different XI are distinct, modulo P or something like that. And uh, otherwise it gets a lot more complicated. So I sort of gave up at that point. Um, I thought, well, maybe that, maybe you can get something out of that. But it occurred to me that you can use the same argument with the Vinogradov mean value theorem directly. Yeah. And so you don't, I mean, that's worse, of course, than you might hope to get, but you, at, least you got, at least we got something which was sufficient, sufficient for the problem. Okay, my iron fist is coming down. Oh, we had a question or a comment um, from Julia Brandes, just a comment in the main theorem, the traditional main term comes from D equals A1 comma Q. And I can't see the rest of the comment, but we're out of time anyway. So let's um, thank Bob again, and maybe that discussion can carry on afterwards. Now we should upload. Our next speaker. Um, so maybe Bob, can you um, unshare your screen? Oh, yes, yeah, sure.